the complications of myocardial infarction all give you hypotension. Whether it is a wall that is rupturing or weakening or an arrhythmia, they all give you low blood pressure. Anything that can give you low blood pressure can make you confused if you're not perfusing your brain. The most common question for a myocardial infarction complication is, What's the most likely diagnosis? They'll show you history, physical, maybe some labs. 64-year-old man had an inferior wall MI last night. Now he's confused. Well, why is he confused? Because his blood pressure is low and his pulse is 45. A cannon A wave is atrial systole against a closed tricuspid valve, so the blood is shooting backwards up into your neck veins. Atrial systole into a closed tricuspid valve, so the blood's bounding backwards up into your neck. And to the 19th century man, that looked like a cannon shot. Ooh, a 3 over 6 systolic minimum radiating to your axilla. That's bad. But the lungs are clear. So what is it? Well, all of these are complications of MI. What do you think? Which of these can cause hypo... All, all of them. Valve and septal rupture. Well, valve and septal rupture would give you rouse, wouldn't they? They'd give you congestion. Extension of the infarction. First, it's an inferior wall. Now it's killed off your anterior wall. Your blood's not pumping anywhere. You've extended your infarction, and now you've developed a sudden pump failure. You should have RALS. Third degree AV block. Oh, yes, you infarct. You know what also is about to happen here? Is that the inferior wall is supplied by the right coronary. The right coronary supplies the inferior wall. The right coronary supplies the right ventricle and the right coronary supplies the AV node. Sinus bradycardia, super common in myocardial infarction. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most common problems, myocardial infarction, because you're simply starved off the SA node. But the other thing about valve rupture, septal rupture, wall rupture, is that they'd all give a tachycardia. So the clue here is, this is bradycardia, hypotension. Why isn't it sinus bradycardia? Bradycardia, hypotension, these all give you tachycardia. Bradycardia, hypotension, wall rupture presents with chief complaint. Dead, doc, dead. I woke up feeling mighty dead today. Pulseless electrical activity. Bradycardia, hypotension, cannon A waves. Bradycardia, hypotension, cannon A waves. Two Irish guys between pints of Guinness in the 19th century Dublin describe bradycardia hypotension cannon A waves, bradycardia hypotension cannon A waves without the EKG. And Eindhoven gets the 1908 Nobel Prize for the invention of the electrocardiogram. And these two guys describe it in the 1820s and the 1840s. How? By seeing bradycardia, low blood pressure, which they thought was a seizure, and cannon A waves going up into the neck. Stokes and Adams describing the heart block. Stokes and Adams describing the heart block. Now, now I've told you what it is. And this is so easy. I'll tell you it's a third degree AV block. What are you going to do? And you're like, kind of, that's so easy. Why are you wasting my time with this easy question? Or giving epinephrine to people with acute MI. That's very good. That solves all problems. You give epinephrine, you're having acute ischemia. I solve all your problems because I give you epinephrine, you die, and then death, boss, is no problem. Zorba the Greek. Hey, boss, life is trouble. Only death is no trouble. That would be epinephrine. Ooh, I want a pacemaker, but you know what? Pacemaker is the most common wrong answer. The answer is atropine. The most common wrong answer is pacemaker because you can give them a pacemaker and with third degree AV block, maybe they definitely need a transvenous. But atropine works instantly. A little squirt of atropine works instantly. Now some people say to me sometimes in the live classes, they go, 
Well, you know, atropine doesn't always work. Some people's third degree AV block, the AV node is infarcted off and the atropine doesn't work. And I go, just because it doesn't work doesn't mean you shouldn't try because I've got two things for you. If it does work, the heart rate goes up by 20, the blood pressure goes up by 20, the IQ goes up. Yeah, but it doesn't work in everybody. Okay, well, what are you going to do faster? Well, we can give a temporary transcutaneous pacer. Oh, I like that. You mean those little things with paddles on there, like Dr. Zoll says, transcutaneous pacer? Oh, this is great. I can give you a little squirt of atropine. It works instant. It raises your pulse. Unblock the AV node. Or we can do what you want, the transcutaneous pacer. Hi, sir. How's your transcutaneous pacer? Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like that. Transcutaneous pacer. Yeah, sending those shocks right through and contracting all my muscles. But it works. I feel much, well, I feel things. Well, my blood pressure's up. My pulse is up. And I've increased a full cup size in the last 15 minutes. It's fantastic. Thank you. So, atropine is like true love. Just because it won't work for everybody doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Atropine raises the heart rate without this, and it works fast. Thank you very much. Uh, so look, the ACLS protocols and the standard algorithmic care of symptomatic bradycardias has not changed in decades. All symptomatic bradycardias, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, symptomatic bradycardias, should get atropine first. And if the atropine doesn't work, a transcutaneous pacemaker, and later a transvenous pacemaker for some with third degree AV block or MOBITS2, or if people who simply the transcutaneous pacemaker and the atropine hasn't worked. What's the order in which to do things? Bradycardia it mostly depends on whether there's symptoms or not. Symptomatic bradycardia, atropine, transcutaneous pacemaker, transvenous pacemaker if it's not resolved. But the asymptomatic bradycardia gets nothing. Sinus bradycardia gets nothing. Sinus bradycardia gets nothing. First degree AV block gets nothing. And MOBITS1, the wanky block, the male pattern hair loss of AV blocks. You don't like how it works. Prolong, prolong, prolong. I'm back, Kenny. Prolong, prolong, prolong. Wanky, come back. Wanky, come back. Oh, you mean the wanky block? Yeah. Second degree AV block, MOBITS2 and third degree. MOBITS2 and third degree always need a pacemaker because they are going to cause syncope and MOBITS2 deteriorates, degrades into third degree AV block. So the bradycardias are always treated with atropine if you're symptomatic. Why are you looking for a third degree AV block uh, here with R RV infarct? Because they have the same arterial supply. The right coronary supplies the right ventricle, the AV node, and the Ah, right ventricle, the third degree by, and the inferior wall. Now, if not effective with the atropine, then you'll use the pacemaker. Right ventricular infarctions basically present with hypotension and signs of pump function. Uh, the lungs will be clear because you can't fill up the lungs with fluid if the right ventricle can't pump the fluid. So the lungs can't fill up if you can't get the blood into the heart. And almost half of inferior wall MIs, 40%, can be associated with some degree of right ventricular infarction. Why don't we talk about them so much? Well, because there's no reason therapy for them uh, uh, besides just giving fluids and you're going to do an angioplasty anyway and some people thrombolytics anyway so it doesn't change too much in management. Uh, the diagnostic question is the most important one. 40% of inferiors have a right ventricular infarction because they have the same arterial supply and what you do is that most of the time the EKG leads are on the left side of the chest so you flip them over to the right side of the chest and you look at the right sided lead for it. The same way if you wear an anterior wall MI, the anterior which wall? Left ventricle. If you were looking for an anterior wall MI, you'd look at V4, V5, V3, 4, 5. In the same way on the right side, you look for V4. Reverse V4 or right-sided V4. Take your pick on which one makes you happier to be able to make the memorization, flip the leads. And the management of it is just giving fluids and avoiding things that might cause volume depletion. 
Nitroglycerin, for instance, can end up causing a vasodilation on the venous side. I remember the veins carry 60% of blood volume, and if you dilate them, they're much bigger. Arterioles only have 3% of blood volume at any given time. Arterioles. And so therefore, you just avoid this so it doesn't cause volume depletion. It's very similar to not combining nitrates and Viagra. Hi, honey. I love you. Tamponade. Hello, Doc. I caught death. Now, tamponade and wall rupture and septal rupture and um, valve rupture, these are all really much less common uh, than they used to be. They are actually almost pre thrombolytic. Uh, pre-angioplasty types of uh, illnesses. Uh, they, happen, they can happen, but they basically happen in extremely severe MIs and much less commonly. That is why 70% of coronary surgery, 70% of the bypasses are gone. The number of people getting bypass surgery is down by 70% in the last 30 years because of the rise of angioplasty and stents. Because this is a sign of people who infarcted. We didn't know about dual antiplatelets. Dual antiplatelets, this therapy is very, very recent, the last five and 10 years. Stenting is uh, relatively recent. So for the 100 year history of the myocardial infarction, except for the last five or 10 years, we couldn't do very much. So it would scar and weaken, and a week later, it would pop. So it's going to look like pulseless electrical activity. You're going to have a normal EKG, but no pulse. Hey, his EKG looks great. Yeah, it does. I mean, except for the fact that he's dead. So what you'll see is, is that the lungs are clear because you can't, yeah, it's going to cause tamponade. You can't fill the lungs if the right ventricle is compressed. You can't fill the lungs if the right side ventricle is compressed. The EKG is normal, but I got no pulse. The most accurate test is an echo or a cath. You'll see compression of all the chambers in diastole. And what you're going to do emergently is pericardiocentesis on your way into the operating room to fix it. Wall rupture, most people die if you can't keep them alive with pericardiocentesis briefly to get them in for an operative repair. VTAC and VFib, if they have no pulse, cannot be distinguished. VTAC can have a pulse. VTAC can even be hemodynamically stable. But VTAC can also be like VFib, having a loss of pulse. Now, if there's a loss of pulse, you can't tell them apart because they both can cause sudden death. And then you, that's why calling for help during a resuscitation, calling for help when somebody loses their pulse, calling for help when somebody loses consciousness, help, help, get me the automatic external defibrillator, is the most important thing because it is the only way you can tell which one of these you have and you don't have pulseless electrical activity and both of these are going to get shocked. This is why the monitoring is so critical because it's not just the monitoring. You can send someone home with a monitor. You can get a, a, one of those watches that monitors your heart rate at home, but that little watch cannot yet shock you back to life. Valve and septal rupture, please repeat everything I just said for wall rupture. It's a sign of a, a much less treatment. It's a sign of necrotic tissue. And it's a sign that the, that the muscle basically is burst through. And the difference between this and tamponade and the, the wall rupture is that here you blow the valve and the person will get shorter breath, hypotension, but you also see congestion in the lungs and a really bad left ventricle. Now, this patient who had a three over six systolic murmur at the apex, that's the most common wrong answer, of course, because people are looking at that murmur saying, gee, it must be a, a, a valve rupture. If we were to give that question for people in a live class or in the question bank, they would say a, a valve rupture, how come it wasn't correct? One, there was bradycardia. Two, there were clear lungs. And the whole point is that that was the point to the question. The point to the question was the critical thinking, meaning that yes, I've got that murmur, but I don't have any of the symptoms or the signs of a severe murmur. Then where did the murmur come from? I don't know, lots of people have murmurs. Who just had that murmur? So, mitral regurge radiates the axilla. Ventricular septal defects are heard at the lower left sternal border, the same place as HOCM, same place as HOCM. And what happens when you have a septal rupture is that you put a catheter into the right side of the heart and you take a sample of the blood from the right atrium.
And in the right atrium, the blood uh, saturation is, is uh, low, and when the, you advance the catheter into the ventricle, the saturation goes up. How come there's a difference in saturation between the right atrium and the right ventricle? Did somebody put the lungs in the tricuspid valve? No, because there's a hole in my heart. The pieces of my heart are so small they could be put through the eye of a needle. And this is how you make the diagnosis question. Now, you will never, even as a general medical doctor, be expected to read echocardiograms. But you will be expected in many residencies to know how to put a catheter into the right side of the heart. And that's why this is the most important question, the step up in saturation, the step up in saturation from the left to right shunt. Om shanti om shunt my heart om step up in saturation is within your expected range of understanding because it answers the question, who needs emergency cardiac surgery? Now, if only 20% of hospitals in the country have a cath lab to do primary angioplasty, primary angioplasty means acute MI angioplasty, much less can do cardiac surgery. So your question is, to know how to suture no. Is that technical? No. Where to put the incision? A number seven blade, a number nine, a straight, a curve? No, 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 no. You'll learn that in surgical residency. That's not the step two question. The step two question is the indications for the procedure. Also, I'm in Wyoming or South Dakota where it's a 20 minute drive just to go to the bathroom. And I have to know when to call the helicopter in to get that patient to emergency cardiac surgery. Hey, am I expected to know how to do emergency cardiac surgery? No. You're expected to know when you're supposed to transfer or get the help you need. Hey, are you expected to know how to be able to fix artery and vein occlusions in the eye, retinal artery occlusion? No, you're expected to know the sudden loss of vision in that eye as being an artery or vein occlusion or detachment, and all of them mean emergency evaluation by ophthalmology. You're supposed to know when it's urgent to get help. The intraortic balloon pump is a device to put into the, the aorta that contracts and expands in sync with the pump function with the left ventricle. When your heart has been infarcted off, remember when I said that before there was angioplasty thrombolytics, hearts routinely, 20%, 30% of the patients, would infarct off and just die off. And you needed to be able to keep people alive to fix holes and fix ruptures for really inefficient dead hearts. So you put a balloon in there. And the balloon, we sometimes use these as external augmentation devices for bad congestive failure or left ventricular assist devices, and they basically contract and expand in conjunction with the native heartbeat just to give you an extra pump, an extra push, while waiting to go to the operating room to fix. Google Images, a wonderful darling, a wonderful, and it's never a permanent idea. It's always temporary just to keep you alive a little while. When the infarct extends, remember we said about reinfarctions? You get an EKG to look for the new uh, site of the infarction, get new CKMBs, and it's an indication that if you haven't had angioplasty, get back up in there because you're infarcting again, you're infarcting. Get back up in there because you got pulmonary, pulmonary edema, you're infarcting, you're killing off the heart, and you need to go in there and open it up if you haven't already. And this was why sometimes that was an indication even for emergency bypass surgery. What would you do if you're infarcting, the heart's dying off, I thrombolytic to you, I gave you, I did angioplasty, maybe I did thrombolytics, now what? Dead last, dead last, dead last emergency surgery because emergency surgery kills people, kills 5% of everybody who undergoes it. Now, you get an aneurysm because an aneurysm wants to rupture. You get an aneurysm because scarred tissue that's necrotic is weaker, and it pops out. 
There's no way you can tell from an EKG that there's an aneurysm. You can tell if there's ischemia, you can tell if there's infarction. Hypertrophies are like 50-50, but the only way to tell if there's an outpocketing is with an echocardiogram, and most aneurysms don't need to be treated unless they look like they're about to rupture, because what's the treatment for an aneurysm? Surgical resection, right? That's not so easy. The problem with aneurysms is that aneurysms create stasis, and stasis create thrombi, and thrombi create the need for anticoagulation. Now, in this post-MI section, the most frequently asked question, because it's for everybody, a percentage of sinus bradycardia, probably the most common complication, that RV infarction, because uh, sinus bradycardia without hypotension, it's hard to know whether you call that really a disease. Your pulse is 45, but you feel fine. Why was our patient in the original question such a disaster? Because he didn't feel fine. He was hypotension and confused. He had two indications for hemodynamic instability. Hypotension, confusion. Chest pain, shortness of breath, hypotension, confusion, means you're not getting enough perfusion. But everybody's going to be discharged home that survives. Aneurysms lead to wall rupture, rare, rare. Septal rupture, rare, rare. Valve rupture, rare, rare. Going home, common, common. So everybody's going to go home on an aspirin. Everybody's not going to go home after they get a stress test. Because if you got angioplasty and you feel fine, we don't have to do routine stress tests. We used to do that to tell us who to cath. But since we want to cath you anyway for the angioplasty, we don't have to do the routine stress test because the stress tests tell you to do cath. And since we already cath you, we don't need to stress you. And if we're not going to stress you, we're not going to do a repeat angiogram unless you have recurrences. Now you see from the paleo, oh, you see from the paleozoic of a minute ago, what do you do for extensions and reinfarctions? Get in there and open that because the only thing that'll fix you is more perfusion. So, if you're not reinfarcting, there's no reason to get back in there. And to remember, how do we tell you're reinfarcting? Because you have recurrent pain. The recurrent pain means you should get an EKG and then more en enzymes, and then you get in there and cath them and balloon it open. Uh, so, routine stress test post MI? No. Every post MI, and now of course this is in the absence of contraindications, gets an aspirin. Everybody should get a beta blocker. Everybody should get a statin. Everybody should be on two antiplatelet drugs for a while. Not permanently, and it's not a step two question to ask you whether it should be six months, 12 months, or 18 months of the two antiplatelets. And with the exception of a contraindication, stroke, no prasagral, stroke, no prasagral, stroke, no prasagral, it's not your question to say, is ticagrelor better than clopidogrel? That's not your question. Your question is, did you use two? You did? Good! <laughs> your question is, did you go home on aspirin? That lowest mortality. You're going to use anti-two platelet drugs for, you know, a while. How long? A while. Beta blockers are anti-arrhythmic and anti-ischemic. They lower mortality. Gadimetesucortisone. Statins. This is where statins do the best. Oh, you have no coronary disease, no carotid disease, no cerebral disease, and you get a high cholesterol, high LDL. Yeah, how high? <laughs> yeah, 7.5% 10 year risk, put in a statins. How much mortality benefit is there? Uh, you know, 1, 2, 3%, 4%. Primary prevention. <gasps> but post MI prevention, big, big prevention decrease in mortality. You see, the studies that showed that bypass surgery lowered mortality were all done before the routine use of statins and second antiplatelet drugs in ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Now, these ACE and ARBs should be used in everybody post MI, but where they're continued is when you have systolic dysfunction. So you can stop them at six weeks if you don't have systolic dysfunction. And there's a bunch of tables in the book that I'll reiterate and resummarize the same basic line point of, yeah, you use them, but when do they lower mortality? When there's LV dysfunction. Dipritamol is a drug that has uh, an indication only in strokes as an alternative to clopidogrel. Dipritamol 
combined with aspirin for strokes, but not for the heart and not for peripherals. It's out in the heart. Now, why am I telling you about something that's not to be used? Because it'll be a choice. It'll be a wrong choice. It'll be a wrong choice, but it'll be a choice. Now, what's the most common cause of death post-MI? Well, it's an arrhythmia. VTAC and VFib. What's the most common cause of death post-MI? Why, it's an arrhythmia. VTAC and VFib. Clear! No, I didn't say like clear like I'm going to shock you. I meant it's very clear. So here goes the thinking. The most common cause of death post-MI immediately is an arrhythmia. Your conduction system doesn't like ischemia. We showed you that ischemia causing VTAC and VFib, you need to fix the ischemia, not put an implantable defibrillator. Fix the ischemia, don't put in a defibrillator. So here's how the thinking went. Why wait for VTAC and VFib? Just give you a prophylactic antiarrhythmic. It's a very nice idea. Except that antiarrhythmics in a small number of people are also proarrhythmic. And in net, this idea of just giving prophylactic antiarrhythmics and saying things like, there's a bunch of PVCs and APCs is wrong because they killed people. So yes, they prevent some arrhythmias, but they cause, on the whole, more than they prevented. So it's a no. Post-myocardial infarction, here are the clear, three clear issues. Don't combine these vasodilators, sildenafil, tadalafil. Uh, don't combine these vasodilators, these nitric oxide enhancers, because they can cause a dangerous hypotension. Next, that's not emergency department, that's erectile dysfunction. And erectile dysfunction is more often from anxiety than it is from beta blockers. And the other part is, how long do you have to wait for sex post-MI? Uh, so uh, people have been all over the place. It used to be, you don't have to wait at all, you can have sex instantaneously. And then it was, you know, wait one or two or three, four weeks, depending on the severity of the MI. Uh, the basic answer is, is that it's safe within a couple of days or weeks. So it's safe pretty much right away, because a sexual activity doesn't last as long as a stress test. For a stress test, you got to do it standing up and keep it up for 20 minutes. And I don't know about you, but it is standing up for 20 minutes, I, I think that basically the stress test is much more myocardial ischemia. Because the average episode of sexual activity actually lasts, it's been clocked. I mean, who's sitting there with the stopwatch? Five to seven minutes. And the answer is Masters and Johnson did that. Five or seven minutes. Doesn't last long. And it doesn't get the heart rate up as much because it's not as much body myocardial oxygen consumption. So that's why the bottom line answer about sex post MI is the last give it the nitrates and the Viagra, the anxiety and the beta blockers. And as long as it says it's a couple of days post MI and there's no persistent pain, it's all good. See you soon.